Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. My name is Nick Morrow with Occupy Fantasy. As always, I'm here to help you break down tonight's MLB DFS main slates on both DraftKings and FanDuel. You can find me on Twitter at Nick Morrow DFS. If you haven't already, please like the video. Also, subscribe to the channel that helps us get more free content like this out to you. If you're not a member of Occupy Fantasy, check the links in the description below. As a member, you get access to the models you'll see me using throughout the video. We also have a private Discord server full of DFS pros to help you improve your game a single lineup builder, a multi-lineup builder, and we also have the Daily Plug article for MLB, of which I'm a contributor, where we will feature our top bats, arms, and stacks for each main slate. So we get a nice 11-game slate here on this Friday. A couple other spots to keep an eye on, but nothing too major. Uh, so really, honestly, a solid slate size. I mean, we've seen some of these 14, 15-game slates. Um, obviously not ideal as far as these videos go. It's really tough to condense them to a half an hour. Um, but also, I mean, there's just so many options. Sometimes it's tough to really parse through them. Um, but I do like the 11 gamers. I think this is kind of a sweet spot for me personally. Um, but yeah, let's get into it here. I do have Mookie Betts pulled up. I just consider him to be one of the best bats on the slate. That's why I want to target him here. Um, Andrew Heaney, he's facing, uh, best is facing Texas. Uh, Heaney, decent arm, obviously has some K upside, but he's been extremely volatile this season. Um, and tonight he's taking on that Dodgers offense who has a lot of righty power. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to play the lefties there either. Um, but if I am stacking Dodgers, Betts is going to be a priority for me. One of the hottest hitters in baseball right now. So really no surprise there. Uh, but I'm not going to go player by player. We're really going to go team by team. I have a notepad file opened up. Um, where I will list my favorite arms and stacks so we can recap at the end of the video. If you are using the Occupy Fantasy model, just make sure you have DK main or FanDuel main selected. Um, there's a 220 matinee in Chicago, then a couple 640 games. Obviously, we don't want those to be included in our data here. So um, we got the stacks up, we got the pitchers up, and then if we want to dig deeper into, into a specific stack, we could pull up the batters page. Um, but that's kind of a secondary thing for this video, but let's get into the slate here. Uh, first game on the board, we have Alex. Alec Marsh and the Kansas City Royals taking on Clark Schmidt and the New York Yankees in New York. So uh, Yankees have been terrible. Um, a few of you know I'm a Yankees fan. I've been miserable uh, this season watching this team and listening to the excuses the front office has been making. But tonight they're getting a really good matchup, and it's kind of undeniable. Alec Marsh on the hill for the Royals comes in, allowing a 353 ISO, 436 Woba, two opposing hitters this season. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Yankees outside of Torres and Stan have been mostly terrible. Anthony Volpe has been half decent. We saw Franchi Cadero get the call up again. Uh, he had a home run last night, but he's very, very much boomer bust. But yeah, I'm not surprised to see the Yankees outside the top 10. I do consider them a viable stack here, ranking 7th in Woba, 3rd in team total, um, but it's really, really tough for me to call them a top priority. Um, I will jot them down uh, versus Marsh and KC, uh, but they're very much boomer bust, and while it's obvious they haven't been very good, they should be a little bit better returning to Yankee Stadium. This is an excellent matchup, and for DFS purposes, they're pretty cheap and relatively low owned, so I don't mind them at all here. Um, like I said, I don't think you really have to discriminate righties versus lefties. I would prioritize Torres and Stanton, uh, but I have zero interest in Marsh on the other side. Uh, on the hill for the Yankees, we have Clark Schmidt. So Schmidt, uh, what's a highly regarded prospect, um, kind of lost a lot of that steam. Um, but yeah, he's been a lot better lately. I mean, the issue with Smith for much of his career, albeit a short one, is that he struggles to get left-handed bats out. Um, he seems to have corrected that over his last few starts, and he is very cheap today at 6,200 on DK. 8K over on Fandle is totally reasonable as well. Uh, so yeah, I don't mind Schmidt here. He's around a 23% K rate, taking on a Royals offense that did just get Sal Perez and Bobby Wood Jr. back, but also a Royals projected starting lineup that has around a 24% K rate. Again, against um, right-handed pitching this season. So I don't mind Schmidt versus the Royals. Um, he's cheap, but certainly carries some risk uh, just because, yeah, it's tough to trust anything in pinstripes right now, if we're being honest. So I don't mind Schmidt here. I think he feels a little bit over on for an 11-gamer over on DK. I do like him as a GPP play on FanDuel. Um, but in cash games, I mean, if you're looking to load up on bats, you could fit Otani or Valdez with Schmidt and feel pretty damn good about your lineup. So I do like Clark Schmidt here. Um, I don't mind the Yankee bats. I don't think it would be insane to play Royals bats. Personally, I won't be getting to them. Uh, so let's move into the next game on the board. We have Alex Wood and the San Francisco Giants taking on Jake Irvin and the Washington Nationals. So... Wood not really popping in the model, no surprise there. Irvin 
maybe the worst arm on the slate in terms of OF index. I think I'm sorting by ownership, so let me just correct that really quickly. Yeah, so Schmidt not nearly as high in the model um, as maybe I described. He is drawing that ownership, though, and that's mostly a price thing. So I do think he's about where he should be here. Uh, but yeah, as for Alex Wood, decent arm. Um, not terrible, but also very inconsistent. Um, coming off a start in which he only won three innings, obviously you don't like to see that. And while this Nationals offense isn't all that dangerous or intimidating on paper, they only strike out 18.6% of the time against left-handed pitching this season. Uh, so there's just not a lot of K upside here for Wood. So um, I respect Wood enough to probably not to, to not want to get to the Nationals bats. Um, and the model agrees with me there. Uh, but at the same time, I really don't have much interest in rostering him as a starter. Um, on the other side... We have Jake Irving going for the Nationals. Irving has been worse against lefties, um, which is why the Giants are going to be somewhat viable here. 343 uh, Woba allowed to lefties this season, 161 ISO. So not great numbers. Um, the Giants obviously have bats like Peterson, Yastrzemski, Conforto towards the top of that order who all hit from the left side who should all have solid upside in this matchup. And the Giants are just outside the top 10 here, ranking 8th and OF index. Ninth in Team ISO, but fourth in Team MOBA, and somewhat surprisingly first in implied team total. So Vegas actually thinks the Giants score more runs than any other offense on the board on this slate. Um, I don't know that I agree, but at the same time, I do like their bats here because they are going to be very cheap on both sides. Uh, but definitely make sure you're favoring the left-handed hitters. Uh, moving into the next game, we have Kota Isenga and the New York Mets in Fenway Park taking on Cutter Crawford and the Boston Red Sox. So Senga has been mostly outstanding, um, coming off one, two, three, five straight starts with eight plus Ks. So we jump over to the pitcher page here. No surprise to see him floating around that top 10, 14 off index rating is solid, 1.19 K per IP. So over a strikeout per inning pitch. Also a great thing to see. I mean, the one issue is the matchup. It's not necessarily ideal. Uh, this Boston's offense, excuse me, Boston offense hasn't been bad at all. Senga, though, 29% K rate this season, um, doing a good job holding opposing hitters to a 293 Woba, um, so really limiting damage, um, and what do we see here in terms of ownership? Yeah, single digits on both sides, 1% on Fando, where he's very expensive, 6% over on DK, excuse me. But for me personally, I do want to get to some shares of Senga in tournaments. I know it's not a great matchup. But you got to look for ways to get different, um, and he's in as quality of form as anyone has seen him at the major league level. Um, he was very hyped coming into the majors this season. Had some walk issues to start the year. He's mostly corrected those. Um, so good GPP, good high-risk play um, in Kodai Senga here. I don't think it would be insane to play Boston bats, but I don't think we need to get that uh, off the grid on a 11-game uh, slate here. On the other side, we have Cutter Crawford on the mound for Boston. I don't know what I'm all that interested in. I mean, he does have a 23% K rate. But he's allowing a 182 ISO to opposing hitters, which is a little bit scary. I mean, he is cheap enough that maybe you can consider him. He's coming off maybe his best start of his entire career. Um, I can actually say that with some confidence. Probably the best start of his entire career. Nine Ks, quality start, one earned run al allowed, got the win across six innings. Um, so, yeah, where he's getting zero ownership, I don't think it's insane to use him as a value piece against the Mets, um, especially if we see Schmidt a little bit too popular. There are some weather issues there in New York, so this could be a pivot for you if you are really looking for value at pitcher, um, but it's very, very, very high risk, and I need to make that clear. I don't consider him a safe option. I probably wouldn't use him in cash. Uh, very risky versus the Mets here, but he is very cheap, Cutter Crawford, so I don't mind him, and... In that same breath, I'm really not all that interested in Mets bats, but at the same time, on paper, they do have some upside. 166 ISO against Vikings for their projected starting lineup. Um, yeah, I mean, Crawford allowing a lot more contact to righties, but similar power numbers to both righties and lefties. So you can kind of target Alonzo, Alvarez, Lindor here. Um, I'm actually going to jot them down. I didn't initially think I'd have much interest, but it is a nice park upgrade. Um, and they are very, they're risky for sure. Um, high-risk tournament type play there are the Mets. So this is one of those instances 
Or I don't think you're insane to play some shares of Crawford. Obviously not in the same lineup, but I don't think you're insane to play some shares of these Mets bats. Um, but on the other side, I do like Senga. Um, I think he, if he's going to stay really low owned, he's an appealing tournament target. Uh, moving into the next game here, we have Ranger Suarez and the Philadelphia Phillies taking on the Cleveland Guardians with rookie Gavin Williams on the mound. So Williams, very talented young arm. Ranger Suarez has been having a pretty good season, actually. Um, a lot better than a lot of people expected, I know for sure. Um, but pulling up the numbers here, Suarez, 22% K rate isn't bad, but he's taking on a Cleveland team here with just a 17.8%. K rate against left-handed pitching. So not a ton of upside here for Suarez. He's going to have to be near perfect because if he is allowing earned runs, you're not really going to offset those with strikeouts. Um, so for me, I don't really have any interest in Cleveland. The model agrees with me here. Um, and then transitioning to the other side, I don't have much interest in Philly bats either. Um, I think Williams is getting a little bit underrepresented in uh, represented at 2% on the DK, 0% on FanDuel. Um, coming into the league, we thought we'd see bigger strikeout numbers out of him. Uh, this Phillies offense does strike out around 24% of the time against right-handed pitching. Um, so if you want to get really weird with it, again, this is uh, very high risk against the Phillies, but he does have some upside at a cheap price. If you want to get off that Schmidt shock, it makes some sense. I do think Schmidt's the safer play, probably the better play with more upside. But again, you're looking to get different in tournaments. If you're playing some chalky bats, maybe a Dodgers stack, something like that. Gavin Williams is a good way to go in that regard. And um, Philly does have some upside here. Um, Williams has allowed a lot of power to left-handed hitters, but not enough for me to really want to rush to them in this matchup. I probably won't get much ownership from either side of this game, if we're being honest. But if there is anything here, a very cheap Gavin Williams does not seem too insane. Um, as a play. So moving into the next game, we have Tommy Henry and the Arizona Diamondbacks taking on Ben Lively and the Cincinnati Reds. So Lively towards the bottom of the model here, Henry just above him. So I do expect we see these stacks kind of popping. Arizona ranking fourth in OF index, seventh in team ISO, fifth in Wolva, tenth in implied team total. So pulling up the statistics for this one. Um, and then on the other side, we have Tommy Henry taking on the Reds. The Reds aren't quite as high in the model as expected, but they are top 10 in both Team Wolva and Team Total, so there is some merit to stacking them here. Uh, but yeah, let's take a look at first Lively in this matchup with Arizona. So he's allowing a 217 ISO to lefties, uh, much worse to lefties, just a 137 to righties this season. 316 Wolva allowed to lefties, 324 to righties. So actually more contact to righties, more power to lefties. What that tells me is we really don't need to get too uh, creative in picking just lefties or righties from this lineup. I think you can go to either side. Um, Corbin Carroll, probably my favorite bat from the stack. Decent bet to hit a home run today. Uh, Lourdes Gurriel, who's been really solid against righties. He's fine here as well. Honestly, this order, one through six, we're talking Perdomo, Marte, Carroll, Walker, Gurriel, Longoria. They all have some appeal to me. And if you really need to lower the price of the stack, Alec Thomas is projected to bat ninth here. This team is a 170 ISO against righties. Um, not as a team, but this projected starting lineup I'm looking at. So I really do like them here. I could see their ISO rating climbing throughout the day as well. So um, nice little spot here for the D-backs. Um, first bed lively. And with this game being in Cincinnati, it's obviously a nice park upgrade for them here as well. On the other side with Tommy Henry. So this is interesting. Ali De La Cruz, obviously one of the highest regarded prospects in baseball right now. He has not been hitting lefties at all. Just an 054 ISO against lefties, 261 Woba. Um, and if we jump over to the batters page, I don't really consider Cincinnati to be a top, top stack, but they are at least worth talking through here. Um, McLean and Steer would be the priorities, then India and then Carcio Strand. Um, I would skip Ellie, and I know it sounds insane. This guy could get on first with a walk and steal three bases. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if there is going to be an entry in stacking Cincinnati, I think we find it leaning more on the righty bats. I wouldn't mind Votto in the lefty-lefty matchup, but like I said, Cruz, who is a righty, um, just want to correct myself there, has been terrible against left-handed pitching, near 40% K rate against lefty so far in the major league. So I think the Reds are okay. Um, if you want to get a little bit weird with it, maybe skip Ellie. Um, so versus Henry, maybe skip Ellie. <laughs> I'm going to write that in my notes here. Um, and yeah, they're pretty high risk, though, because if they do get into this bullpen, um, Arizona's bullpen, not great, but they do 
a decent job playing matchups. They could make this a much tougher spot than it looks like on paper against just the starting pitchers. So a uh, decent spot there for bats on both sides. Really no interest in either arm. Moving into the 8 o'clock games now, we have Tony Gonsolin and the Los Angeles Dodgers taking on Andrew Heaney and the Texas Rangers. So... Jumping back over to the Stacks page, I mean, Gosselin's been okay. Um, he's priced below 8K on both sides. I don't think it's crazy to maybe get to him. Uh, me personally, though, uh, just not really enough upside. Uh, really hasn't shown much of a ceiling at all this season. Uh, not to mention, this is a pretty terrible matchup here against Texas, who is one of the better offenses in baseball. Certainly one of the better offenses in the American League in this interleague matchup. So um, just taking a quick look here. Yeah, Texas not really popping. Good to see. Uh, Gonson not really popping, good to see. I kind of consider that matchup a wash. I respect both sides enough not to want to get exposure there. Um, but on the other side, we have a much more interesting situation. We have Heaney, um, whose K rate's actually down this season, more than 10%, 35% K rate last year, just 24.9% this year. Um, so not the same upside, obviously not driving the ownership he would in seasons past, just as an upside play. Uh, getting a little bit of ownership, but not enough to really even consider him. Against the Dodgers, I just have zero interest, honestly. I mean, the K rates down, the Dodgers don't strike out much against lefties. Obviously, a massive, massive upside here for these bats. And no surprise at all, the Dodgers are the top stack on the board. We're looking at aggregate ownership here, and 57% on DK, 48 over on FanDuel. That isn't terrible. Um, so for me, the Dodgers are the best bats on the on the slate, um, certainly the best stack. Um, we're going to have to favor the right-handed hitters here. Um, but yeah, guys like Muncie and Freeman are pretty much matchup proof. I wouldn't mind getting to them, but if we're talking priorities, Mookie Betts is number one, followed by Will Smith, then Jamie Martinez. And if Chris Taylor makes the lineup here, he's very cheap on both sides, plenty of upside against the lefty. He is a pinch hit risk if the Tigers do go, or Tigers, Rangers do go to a righty in their bullpen. Uh, but at the same time, really, really love the Dodgers here. Definitely lean on the right handed bats. But if you're looking to get a little bit different, mix in Muncie or Freeman. Um, probably one don't want both uh, using up roster spots, but they are going to allow you to get a little bit different in the field if we do see this ownership climb on the Dodgers. But Dodgers, best stack on the slate. Pretty confident saying that. All right. So just to recap that game, no real interest in Texas bats or Wisconsin. Really, really love the Dodgers bats. No interest in Heaney. Um, next game here, we have the Atlanta Braves with Mike Soroka on the mound taking on Freddie Peralta and the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, Soroka is still very cheap, pretty talented arm, but he's working his way back from an injury. We really haven't seen any good games out of him, except for one start, so I'm really not all that interested in Soroka here. Um, decent spot for Milwaukee, not really what I'm rushing to get to them. And then we have Freddie Peralta on the other side, who is a very talented arm. Um, but yeah, very, very tough to trust him here against this Braves offense. So jump over to the Stags page. I mean, they're facing Freddie Peralta, so I don't know that I'm going to rush to get to them. But it's rare you see the Braves um, sub-25% owned on both sites. And I do really like their upside here if you're going to get them at low ownership. The issue, like I mentioned, is Peralta, um, talented arm, 27% K rate, has been in quality form. But if we look at his season-long numbers, he is still allowing a 205 ice to opposing hitters, north of 200 to both righties and lefties, 330-ish Woba, which is about league average allowed. So not the best matchup on paper, um, but it's good enough for me to want to get there in tournaments for sure. And I mean, you could look at this entire lineup and see upside. I mean, Acuna, Olsen, obviously MVP candidates. Sean Murphy, not far behind them. Really like Ozzy Alves. Austin Riley's was in a slump. Heading into the All-Star break, it seems he's fully broken out of that. I think he's three home runs the last three or four days. So really like him here as well. Love the Braves bats, um, and I respect them enough to probably not get to much Freddie Peralta, but he does have K upside here. The Braves do strike out a decent amount, but like I said, I'd rather get to them here at low ownership against Peralta. Um, but yeah, they're a high risk option. I will say that. Probably wouldn't be rushing to any Braves bats in cash, really. Um, on the other side, we did quickly mention Soroka. I don't really have any interest in him, um, but I do respect him enough to probably not get to many or any Milwaukee bats. So we can move into the next game on the board here. It's a little bit of a tricky one. We have Lance Lynn on the hill for the Chicago White Sox taking on Joe Ryan. And the Minnesota Twins. So Joe Ryan popping towards the top of the model. No surprise at all to me there. Lance Lynn also popping towards the top of the model. I think part of that is the matchup with Minnesota. They do strike out a ton against righties. 
Um, but I would want to keep a close eye on Wynn's ownership. I mean, on DK where he's 7,600, you're getting him priced similarly as guys like Clark Schmidt, only a little bit more expensive. I do think he makes a lot of sense. 28% K rate on the season. And as I mentioned, this Twins offense strikes out a ton against righty. So while there is risk here, Lynn is very volatile. You don't know what you're going to get from him on a night to night basis. He is still the type of player I'd like a lot in tournaments. Very high ceiling, um, hoping that ownership comes down a bit. But as it stands, Lance Lynn certainly in play. Um, very high K upside. High K upside. Just taking some notes. Um, first, the Twins here. So, some risk, but I do like him a lot. Um, as a tournament option, then on the other side, we mentioned we have Joe Ryan here. 29% K rate for him. Uh, better matchup. Uh, the White Sox not quite as dangerous, not as much K upside, but the UK around 24% of the time against righty. So I like Joe Ryan here. Uh, I'm going to check his game log quickly. I think he had a bad start or two. Um, he looked okay last time out. Three earned runs allowed. The start before that, five earned runs allowed. So he is allowing runs. But at the same time, he's K'd seven plus in one, two, three, four, five of his last six starts. So you know you're going to get probably around seven plus K's out of him here. Um, he is pretty expensive, but he's reasonably owned. Um, one of the more popular pitchers, but towards the top, we actually have pretty flat ownership tonight. So I do like Joe Ryan. Um, he's solid everywhere against this White Sox offense. So really like both pitchers here. Not much interest in either stack, but that shouldn't come as much of a surprise. We can move into these late games now. We have Ohan Oviedo and the Pittsburgh Pirates taking on Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Angels. So we can start with Otani. Uh, really not that complicated. One of the best arms on the slate. He is super expensive, though. He's been a little bit inconsistent lately. Still a 30-plus percent K rate, which is outstanding. Holding imposing hitters to a sub-300 Woba. Also outstanding. Uh, very popular on both sides. Very expensive. Uh, but Pittsburgh's been striking out where their offense started the season hot, they really come back down to earth. So I like the matchup for him here. Uh, so no surprise at all, Shohei Otani, one of the best arms on the slate. Um, and I don't really think that's a hot take at all. Um, but yeah, moving on to the other side of things, we have Ohan Oviedo, who I would like to stack against, but the issue is with Otani pitching, you can't use him, and he is obviously their best hitter. Um, I think you could still consider Angels bats here. Moniak looks exceptional. Uh, Hunter Renfro should be hitting towards the middle of this order. He's been fine in righty righty spots this season. Zach Neto, affordable um, and likely leading off. So I'm going to go ahead and add the Angels here versus Oviedo as a stack to consider. Um, but you can't use Otani, which obviously hurts their upside a bit, but it should also lower their ownership considerably as well. So uh, like both sides of what the Angels are doing in this matchup, really no interest in Pittsburgh. Uh, but moving into the next game here, we have Framber Valdez and the Houston Astros taking on J.P. Sears. And those Oakland Athletics. So Valdez coming off a start in which he came 13 Angels. He did allow five earned runs, but he still hit value. I mean, when you're going to record 10 plus strikeouts, you have some wiggle room. Um, he's expensive on both sides, but he's in an excellent spot here against this Oakland offense. I know the A's have been a little bit pesky over the last few slates, but we look at their lineup here. I mean, they're pretty terrible against lefties. I mean, we're dealing with very small sample sizes, but just a 290 Woba for their projected starters against lefties. Valdez, 26% K rate, which is up from last season. Um, and these A's K around 25% of the time against left-handed pitching. So Valdez, no surprise at all. Probably the best arm on the slate if we're just talking points of high floor and high ceiling. Going to be very popular as a result. Um, excellent everywhere, though. Really, really do like Framber Valdez. If I'm going to eat chalk, it's usually a pitcher. Probably would probably, uh, I would probably go to Valdez over Otani. Stumbled over my words there because it is a tough decision, um, especially if we're going to see Valdez higher own. But I do like the matchup um, for him better. And he is in exceptional form right now. So love all this, zero interest in Oakland bats. Then on the other side, we have J.P. Sears, who does have some K upside, but I still have no real interest in him. Um, checking the model here, Houston just outside the top 10 in most categories, or just inside it, most categories rather. Ninth in OF index, sixth in team ISO, 14th Wova, 16th total. Um, they've been pretty inconsistent. We saw some of their bats come alive last night. I think Bregman finally in a home run. Um, McCormick, Maybe their hottest hitter right now, which is a little bit surprising to see, like hitting in the sixth or seventh hole. Uh, but I don't mind Astros bats here. I think you're going to get them very low owned. Not really a priority. Um, but against Sears, they do have um, some upside. So favor the right-handed hitters. Um, it is a high-risk matchup. 
but I do like McCormick and Bregman, and there are no other righties in this order. Guys like Abreu, Dubon, not crazy about Pena, but he's viable um, to probably get to some Houston stacks here against J.P. Sears. Moving into the last game of the night, we have Yusei Kikuchi and the Toronto Blue Jays taking on Bryce Miller and the Seattle Mariners. So taking a look here, we see Kikuchi floating around the top five of the model, uh, Bryce Miller floating around the top. 10 spot in the model. Uh, Kikuchi, very, very, very much inconsistent. Um, he's allowed four earned runs in two of his last three starts, but also looks decent at times. I mean, he did a good job limiting damage against Arizona, had an outstanding start against Oakland a few starts ago, who we talked about. So in tournaments, Maybe I can see getting to Kikuchi. Um, the other benefit in this spot is that Seattle does strike out a ton against lefties, uh, near 26% K rate against left-handed pitching this season. But at the same time, I mean, they do have some dangerous bats here, and Murphy, Hernandez, Suarez, who all hit lefties exceptionally well. Uh, Dylan Moore and Pollock towards the bottom of the order. Not exciting plays, but very cheap with upside. So this might be one of those other spots where I consider both sides. I'd probably get to Kikuchi before the Mariners, but the fact that they're ranking fourth in Team ISO tells me there is at least some viability here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and write down both sides of this one. Mariners versus Kikuchi, high risk, favor right-handed hitters, and then Kikuchi against the Mariners, high risk, um, but cheap. High risk, cheap. Okay. Um, then on the other side, I already mentioned Miller floating around the top 10. I don't really have much interest in him. 24% K rate. The, Blue Jays K only around 20% of the time against right-handed pitching. So he's been decent, and I do respect him enough to not be rushing to Blue Jays bats here, but at the same time, I really don't have much interest in Miller, um, who is 9,100 on both sides. If he was, say, 8K, I'd have a little bit of interest, but at 9K, there are better arms for cheaper. Um, and then as far as Toronto bats go, I'm really not seeing them pop all that well in the model. Um, Miller allowing base runners but not allowing a ton of power, which certainly limits their upside here. We see a very low team, very low implied team total for them. So really not something we have to rush to get to. So let's do a quick re recap of the slate here. For an 11 game slate, a lot of arms I like and a lot of stacks I like. We'll start with the arms. Uh, Framer Valdez against Oakland, outstanding. Really, really like him here. Going to be chalky, but he's just an excellent option. Clark Schmidt against the Royals, some risk, but he's done a better job lately getting those lefties out, so the numbers should start to flat for him as far as splits are concerned. Very cheap on both sides, but keep an eye on his ownership. If he's one of the higher-owned pitchers on the slate on DK, I can see pivoting to some of the other value options we're about to discuss. Uh, we have Otani here, whose name I accidentally spelt wrong against Pittsburgh. Uh, you know what kind of upside you're getting out of him. This is an offense not very familiar with Otani, um, so I can see him having a massive game here at home in Los Angeles. Yeah, no surprise there. Not really a hot take. Love Otani is an arm. Joe Ryan against Chicago looks good everywhere. Lance Lynn in the same game. A lot cheaper, but also a lot riskier, but also a ton of K upside. So one of my favorite tournament plays tonight, wouldn't mind using him over Clark Schmidt if he is lower on, but I think both those guys are going to be popular. Um, but again, some riskier. Lynn is very inconsistent, but one of the higher ceilings on the board, point per dollar. Kodai Senga, another high-risk option I consider against Boston. Very risky, but he's in quality form. Cutter Crawford, similar situation, but say for 2 or 3 K cheaper. Um, riskier even than Senga or Lynn, but also... Uh, plenty of upside against this Mets team, so don't mind Crawford there. Williams, we haven't really seen the K metrics out of him that we were expecting when he got promoted. Um, very high risk here against Philly, but if he's going to be unknown, I don't mind him. And then Kikuchi has upside against Seattle, but he's very much boomer bust. Um, wouldn't shock me if he did well here. Wouldn't shock me if he struggled, and that's why we have the bats featured for them as well. Um, so segueing into top stacks here, the Dodgers against Heaney, probably my favorite on the board. No surprise there. Keep an eye on their ownership. They seem a little bit lower owned than expected, um, but Dodgers definitely my favorite stack. Giants for Sermon, favorite the lefties. Um, we have the Angels versus Oviedo. Uh, their upside's kind of cap because you can't use Otani, but they're going to be low owned as a result. Don't mind them. Mickey Moniak stands out as maybe a one-off bat if you're not stacking angels but want to get something from that game. Um, I do like the Braves against Peralta, but Peralta is in good form, so that's a high-risk play. Uh, but if you're getting the Braves uh, sub-25% aggregate ownership on both sides, that makes them appealing. Um, the Astros are fine here against J.P. Sears. Uh, the Yankees look good here against Marsh. They've been terrible, though, so I'll call them boomer bust. 
Um, only really have interest in them if they stay low loans. The Mets against Crawford. We talked about Crawford being a decent arm with upside. Um, he's also ball little, so you could get to the Mets. D-backs for Spen Lively. They look good here. Lefties have a little bit more power, but the righties have been getting more contact, so both sides of the plate look fine against Lively. Uh, the Reds, we have Henry. If you want to get a little different, maybe skip a popular Ellie Dan Cruz. He's been really, really struggling against left-handed pitching. High-risk option here, um, but I do like the Reds. Uh, definitely lean on the righties towards the top of that order, though. Um, then the Mariners against Kikuchi. Obviously a very high-risk boomer bust type play. We consider Kikuchi as an arm. We also consider the Mariners bats in high-risk tournaments, but definitely don't want them in the same lineup. Um, so nice 11-game slate tonight. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. My name is Nick Marlowe with Occupy Fantasy. You can find me on Twitter at Nick Marlowe DFS. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, check the links in the description below to sign up to Occupy today. Let's have some fun tonight, everyone, and make some money. Take care and good luck.